everyone. Welcome back to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea. And today we have a very special guest. We have a friend of our producer, Mark Boudreau. Who knew he had friends? Who knew? Um, but this is John Mann, who's here. And this is a really nice little bio Mark wrote for him. Wrote so, up, yeah. To, to tell us who he was. Because Grace and I were inquiring as to who this man was. Like, who's this person you're dragging into the studio? Right? So, um, from, from the words of Mark Boudreau. <laughs> In the words of Mark Boudreau. John Mann is from Fredericton. He's a filmmaker. He went to Acadia. Hey, Linnea. Because <laughs> that's where I went. He is my age, so early 30s. <laughs> Ladies. He is engaged to a girl named Sam. Now, Mark says that she's from Cape Breton. We found Which out. Which I got excited about. This I'm is from wrong. Cape Breton, so she's from she's PEI. Not. She's from the other island. Um, also acceptable. John has diabetes. Uh, <laughs> his favorite movie is Jaws, Mark thinks, but he was correct. <laughs> Um, and John just wrapped shooting, um, on his new mini series called Pub Crawl that was shot in the historic bars in Halifax, which is very cool. Uh, so, oh, oh, and, um, last note, he has a Boston Terrier named Hugo. That's a great name. For a Such dog. a great name. So, uh, that is John Mann. Now, we without can, further ado, yeah. welcoming John Here Mann to the studio. Hello, hi. <laughs> that, was, that was mostly true. Are you going to have that bio permanently now? Like, top of the resume? Well, I was thinking, like, more of, like, gravestone. Bio. Oh, epitaph. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm tired of all these short but sweet epitaphs. I yeah. want long yeah. things. Yeah. I want a novel. I want the whole obit carved in stone <laughs> on the whole pillar. <laughs> You know, everybody we talk about in this podcast is dead, so it makes sense that we talk about what we want on our epitaphs. <laughs> we yeah, open yeah with I noticed death. that was a common theme. <laughs> yeah. So just, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. It's safer to talk about dead people. Yeah. You grounded know. in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so what dead person are we talking about today, Grace? Uh, so the dead person we are talking about today uh, and the Heritage Minute that we are doing, which we thought would be appropriate for John, is Nat Taylor, who is the inventor of the multiplex. Oh, cool. Yeah. Good yeah. call, guys. So we're going to talk cool. about him, his whole life, growing cool. up in Toronto. The invention of Oh, because he's the, the guy, he's the heritage minute where he's like, but what if we did more? And like oh, pulls, yeah. off the, <laughs> pulls off the top of the, his little diorama. He's got the yeah. little right, uh, Cineplex right. diorama. And he's like, but what if we had this many theaters? <laughs> and all the ladies are like, oh, my God. <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> it's like mind boggling. Yeah. Like, no. Whoa. I just want, I want him to just be like, but wait, there's more. Yeah. And like keeps pulling off a roof and a roof <laughs> That's and a SNL roof. Version, right? <laughs> and by the end, there's like 48 yeah. cinemas all stacked next to each other. He's like, it's going to be great. <laughs> there's going to be more. Can you believe it? <laughs> and they're like, what? I can't hear you. He uh, he seems very passionate in that uh, heritage minute. Yeah, and yeah. he's a cool guy. We're cool. gonna so we're gonna like talk about his invention of the multiply. It's more of an innovation, I think. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think adding a do- a wall in a room <laughs> is not an invention, <laughs> but you know. Uh, so we'll talk about his innovation of the multiplex, but then also just like his wider contributions to Canadian cinema because he's actually like a huge proponent of Canada having its own cinema okay. industry. Cool. So previously to that, you would have like American films who would distribute their movies and then Canada would kind of like after the American distribution, they'd be like a secondary market for Get all of extras. those film reels. Yeah. But he's like, but what if we had like our own born and bred cinema scene? What if? So we're going to talk all about that as Sweet. well. Cool. Cool. So Nat Taylor was born in 1906 to a Jewish family living in Toronto, Ontario. Mm-hmm. He had four siblings. Fanny, Mesh, Ida, and Sylvia. One more time. <laughs> Fanny, Mesh, Ida, and Sylvia. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Which of those is your favorite? Are those mine is Mesh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just want to say, I just want to say that Nat is also like, I think of that as a girl. Like, are those all girls? Or are those all boys? Those, those are, are very all girls, I'm pretty sure. Mesh. Mm. Who's to say? Who's to say? Because it's not a name. But um, <laughs> Nat, I think his name must be Nathaniel, but I've always, I but maybe assume. it's just Nat. Because he doesn't go by Nate. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. That's cool, That's yeah. A cool name. Nat King Cole. Yeah. Oh, it reminds yeah. Me of Nat like Taylor. The only two. <laughs> Nat who partied at Gatsby's would have been named Nat. Oh, yeah. 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 And, yeah, he, like, totally looks the part. Like, <laughs> the, the guy that cast in the Heritage Minute is very similar to what he actually oh, looked good. like. So, like, the slick black hair, the mustache. Yeah. Like, just, yeah. Great little guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> From an early age, the young Nat demonstrated a love for film and cinema, following in his father's footsteps, who owned a movie theater. Okay. So his father was originally a tailor, but when he emigrated from Latvia Wait, to Canada... Wait, isn't his name Nat Taylor? This is, yeah, so his last oh. name is Taylor. <laughs> I wonder if that's like a Anglified version of what their Latvian name would have been. I'm saying that as the person was who was supposed Latvian to research this. Was his Latvian name the Latvian word for Taylor? <laughs> Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. Maybe. That would make sense. I mean, that's the origin of a lot of last names. That's like, like my way, last, way, way, well, way Well, my back. last name is Swinomer, which directly goes back to like Swinehammer. It's like the dude who killed the pigs. Oh. How not joking. Have you not told me this before? <laughs> How it's have like we been friends super for so German, long? It's like a super German name. It's like Schweinhammer. <laughs> it's like a German word, too, where they, mm. like, compound a bunch of words to have a very specific emotion detail. Yeah. It's like, he's the man who kills swines with hammers. <laughs> yeah. I'm basically, like, a Thor who kills pigs. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Thor killed a bunch of pigs. Maybe. Maybe. Um, but when his father immigrated from Latvia, there's a lot of like discrimination into what professions you can enter into. Um, but film was this really acceptable um, place for Jewish people to find work. Okay. So like the wider community thinks it's okay for Jewish people to work in cinema. Okay. Cinema is not like prestigious at this time. It's kind of like weird. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of finger motions yeah. right now, which cannot be translated yeah. uh, via audio. It's translating but... to me, though. I'm understanding. <laughs> I hope John is understanding. Maybe it. not. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> So Jewish people played a major role in creating the film industry in Hollywood during the first half of the 20th century. Metro Goldwyn Mayer, 20th Century Fox, Columbia Pictures, Paramount Pictures, Universal Pictures, and Warner Bros. were all led by Jewish people. Can I hop in for a second? Yeah. yeah. Mayer? Mayer, yeah. The second M in MGM, St. John, New Brunswick. Is he from St. John's, New Brunswick? He is. St. John. Uh, oh, St. John, sorry. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, New Brunswick. <laughs> what a faux pas. <laughs> what a faux pas. <laughs> really? Really yeah, interesting. Really. So a lot of these Jewish people were immigrants or the children of immigrants from Germany and Eastern Europe. So in his book, An Empire of Their Own, Neil Gabler wrote that in the movie industry, there were, quote, none of the impediments imposed by loftier professions and more entrenched businesses to keep Jews and other undesirables out. Gabler also argued that because of discrimination in the predominantly WASP America due to their mm. Jewishness, the, quote, Jews could simply create a new country, an empire of their own, so to speak, an America where fathers were strong, families were stable, people attractive, resilient, resourceful, and decent. The 20th century American dream was to a considerable degree depicted and defined by Hollywood and therefore defined by Jewish people. Hmm. Which I thought was hmm. super cool. That it's is like, cool. And, and it makes sense and like, that's the America that so many people want to happen. And so, of course, it's like a minority group that, like, wants to achieve that exactly. so desperately. Sure. Especially as an immigrant, like, minority yeah. group that comes and it, it, it's you want to be able to, you want it to be your America. Like, you want to see yourself in that America. I wonder if it was, like, a little bit of, like, an imposter syndrome, too, of them putting America, like, up on a pedestal of, like, what it could be. Yeah. 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 yeah even, like recently not to get like too contemporary but you're starting to see that like maybe america isn't as progressive as we pretend it is yeah yeah or they wish to portray themselves mm -hmm. as yeah and i think it's even like I, I mean the america that gets portrayed in cinema has probably never existed mm -hmm. but or at least didn't exist for all classes of people and all mm -hmm. people from different backgrounds but yeah you can see that like it's almost like clinging to a dream of like, I came to this country for an opportunity and they do get the opportunity, but it's almost like of their own making. Right. Nothing's handed to them. Right. Which is kind of the American dream mm -hmm. in some way. Like anyone can make it if you just try hard and believe in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> So back to Nat, at the age of 12, he broke into the movie business. Um, he did this by selling ads on the backs of Hollywood postcards at two Queen Street movie theaters. So okay. he goes to a movie theater and they're like, you know, he you can make extra money if you like sold moviegoers these postcards with like you know Clark Gable on the back or whoever. Okay, um, he would sell them for a he would sell a thousand <laughs> for three dollars. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Which I mean, I don't know what the currency exchange is. It just sounds crazy. You can buy a thousand of anything for three dollars. It's just that's so many <laughs> postcards. In 1923, at the age of 17, Nat entered university to pursue a law degree from Osgoode Hall at Toronto University. 
At the same time, he began managing and operating the Monarch Theater on College Street, which was financed for him by his father. So his father okay. has, like, a small, like, franchise of theaters, and he's mm. like, here you go, son. Run this theater for me. <laughs> Dad's he's like, sure, daddy. <laughs> with, that, with that mid-American, or what is it? Mid-Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic accent. That Mid-Atlantic accent. See? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, the no, silver no. screen is calling me. <laughs> <laughs> so what that, year are we at right now? Where are we here? So this so would paint a be this would be like um, like late depression, I think, uh, or maybe yeah. the nineteen twenties, like late. 19- this is pre World War Two. Yes. Yeah, so this, yeah, this post World War One, pre World War Two, Canada. Yes, it cool. would be uh, nineteen twenty three was when he entered university. So yeah, yeah, not depression. I lied. Okay. Bad at math. I was doing the numbers in my head. Didn't oh, work out. This is not a math not podcast. A math podcast. <laughs> so his experiment with the Monarch Theater fails after oh, a few months. Okay. He's bad at running a theater, apparently. <laughs> Good. Um, Go back to law school. So he goes back to law school. <laughs> <laughs> after graduating, Knapp dipped his toes into the world of law, but this would, again, only last a few months. Okay. He's like, I'm not made to be a lawyer. <laughs> Instead, he decided to plunge into the world of movies. He became a film buying agent for about 30 independent theater operators who did not have his talent for haggling with powerful Hollywood film studios. So from my understanding, how it has been explained to me, uh, thank you to Hunter Scully of the North of Normal podcast who helped me try to understand this, but the like way that cinemas would get movies is because the distributors would come and you essentially have to like there's only a finite number of the reels mm-hmm. for the movie. So right. you have to be able to haggle and get those movies at a good price for a certain amount of time mm-hmm. before the distributor moves on to another cinema. So he's just really good at that, apparently. He's very good at negotiating good prices for these independent or did, did you say he wasn't good at it? He was good at okay. it. So he had yeah, like a really good reputation. He finally found something he's good at. I know yeah. he's had some failures, but... <laughs> Which, I mean, it's I'm kind of a blend him. of law and, like, right? movie a little He's bit. like l- a it's more litigator. sales, I guess. Yeah, salesman. Mm-hmm. Sure. Which, I mean, what are lawyers if not salesmen? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Mic <laughs> job. <laughs> We're coming for you next, lawyers. <laughs> no one is safe. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Nat's reputation as a brilliant film booking agent became widespread. In 1934, Nat formed 20th Century Theatres, which at its peak operated 72 theatres in Ontario. At the time, the chain was called Twin X. By the 1940s, Nat was managing 17 20th Century Theatres. In 1941, the new Odeon Theatre chain attempted to recruit him as its first general manager, but Nat walked away from the offer and instead took a job with their new, smaller rival, Famous Players Film Company. Nat began operating their 25 theaters as well as the 17 20th century theaters. And he also bought interest in Famous Players Company. I just had no idea that people were going to so many movies, that there were so many theaters. That it was like, there's no TVs. Yeah. So it was I like guess. the entertainment. It's crazy too. Like Famous Players just, I think, just closed really? because of COVID. Like, oh, it was, like, wow. they still had, like, a ton of theaters in the States. Wow. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. And I can imagine that during the 30s and 40s, it's kind of just, like, a cheap thrill to, like, Such get away. Escape, yeah. yeah. Right? Because in the 30s, like, the film's already made, so it's not, like, and during the Depression or something. It's not like you're paying more people to and make we're it. And we're out of the so. silent film era, so these are, like... Yeah. Talkies. 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 Talkies, yeah. <laughs> Go see a talkie, Grace. Yeah. My favorite movie as a kid was Singing in the Rain, which is oh, a movie about movie. making oh, movies, yeah. which I love. That is a great movie. Yeah. It's all about, like, transition from silent to, like, talkie films, yeah. which I love. That was one of my, like, first ballet recitals. It's <laughs> Singing in the Rain. <laughs> That's so good. Actually, it's tap. It was tap. Okay. That but, makes more sense, to be honest. But we did. We had the umbrellas. <laughs> So Nat is the head of 20th Century Theatres, which was now the Ontario branch of the Famous Players Canadian Corporation. So he, like, helped with a merger between those two companies. While he's working there, he builds one of the world's first Cineplex movie theatres in Ottawa, Ontario, at the Elgin Theatre. Which is, I've been there. Yes. So, yeah, I've been to the Elgin Theatre. How was it? Is it? Does it look like an old theatre, or has it been, like, renovated and stuff? I don't, it was just, like, a Cineplex. 
Okay. Because I like oh, when theaters look old, yeah. like look yeah. vintage. I went to a cool theater like that when I was in Pittsburgh. That was like... It's bigger in the U.S. than it like is here. an yeah. old school. It's all the independent ones. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you could drink there, I remember, mm. which was yeah. really cool. They had it's cocktails for the movies. It's be- Yeah, it's because we have all these like big box chains. Yeah. Like, yeah, going to independent movie theaters is like a way better experience than... Yeah, it sounds really cool. Like you can get food and like... Yeah, yeah, food yeah. And, like, mm-hmm. Get it in the like theater and stuff. Yeah. I just want to eat pizza. <laughs> in the theater. <laughs> We're getting on lunchtime. <laughs> That's all that means. <laughs> so Elgin's second screen opened in December of 1947 on a patch of land adjacent to the original, in which was constructed in 1935. So he's like, this is his big idea. He's okay. like, we have a theater. It's a cineplex or a multiplex right. with two screens. So at the at the time, at first, uh, the same program would play in both auditoriums, <laughs> which I just think is funny. Like it's just like we like, like not even staggered, like just like same time, same movie. Maybe they're a little staggered, which makes sense. Okay. But it's like we have two screens and we're gonna show the same thing <laughs> twice. Hope you like Gone with the Wind. <laughs> watch one screen with your left eye and one screen with your right eye. <laughs> yeah, I really hope you like Gone with the Wind. So, yeah, so the, uh, originally in both auditoriums, it's the same film. But several years later, Nat came up with this brilliant idea of selling tickets to different movies from the same box office. Insane. Laying claim to the first to do so. So it's not just the first in Canada, just like anywhere. To have two separate to movies have playing. two movies running <laughs> under one box office. So I guess before you could have a theater with one box office and they would sell this movie and you could have another one in your chain doing the other movie, but... But you this know. is the exact same theater. This is the exact Whoa. same theater. More. More. <laughs> more theater. He just wants more. Yeah. So you'd literally just go out and be like, one, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one. No Take more it. details. <laughs> just one. So Nat then built the world's first trio of cinemas under one roof. Oh, my God. But wait. Where will it end? There's more. Oh, no. Then he built the first fourplex. No. Then the first Five plaques. Impossible. Hold on to your seats. <laughs> your socks are about to be knocked off because he also built the first theater in a shopping mall. Oh, stop. Which was also the first underground theater. Now we have them underground. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And the first one in an office building. <laughs> oh, my God. I just think it's so funny that these are recorded. Like, who cares? Isn't Park Lane like all those things? Yeah, it's underground, underground in a mall, movie. in an office building. First Maybe one that's across what it was. from a Pete's. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want them to keep track. Of first all one on a south-facing street, <laughs> like the first theater that began construction on the on May fifteenth. Yeah, it's gonna like yeah. really yeah. <laughs> He has all of these self-made awards on the wall. Like yeah. First He's two. The these are recorded because he recorded them. Yeah. Like <laughs> First cinema with an odd number of seats. <laughs> <laughs> He's a real innovator. Uh. Um... <laughs> So where does he go from there? Um, well, he's not done with firsts because he builds... It, this one is actually kind of cool. He builds the first theater outlet in Canada that was dedicated to art and foreign films, um, mm-hmm. which was done with the assistance and like in dedication of his wife, Yvonne. So his wife, mm-hmm. Yvonne, is basically like his business partner. Okay. Um, and she is she's more influenced on like the cinema side of things, so the production of movies, oh, not so much cool. like the construction of movie theaters. So he's in love. He's in I love. Missed that bit. Yeah. That's good. And then he started building Toronto International Studios, which is now Canada's largest movie plot uh, or movie lot, excuse me, um, in the late 1950s. I'm gonna ask, and this might be a really dumb question, but Toronto International Film Lot is that like related anyway to like TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival? Like, did that come out of that creation? I have no idea. It's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know either. Okay, um, I'm not I supposed a, I to know. I have a feeling that Nat had something to do with TIFF. Probably. I'm not here to know things. I'm here to learn <laughs> things, Grace. So like, <laughs> so. I don't remember the name specifically, but it will come up later, Mm -hmm. uh, is that Nat has a huge participation in, like, cinema publications. So he runs, like, 
Canada's like Film Digest, basically. So it seems like that's something yeah. that he would have a foot in. Right, which is like the beginning of like reviews and critiques mm-hmm. of cinema from a Canadian perspective. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if he was involved right. in TIFF in some way. Cool. Um, he also cool. lives to be quite old. Like he lives into the 21st century. Yeah. So like Whoa. he probably, yeah. he definitely went to a TIFF. I bet oh. you he was at TIFF. Probably. <laughs> Let's find that out. <laughs> I want the pictures. He I want the evidence. He was tiffing it up. <laughs> uh. So by 1969, however, Nat was worried about his age, which I just said that he lives into the 21st century. <laughs> Don't worry about it, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, for three decades of his life, he's just like, I could die any day. <laughs> it's not a good way to live. <laughs> no. Why is he so worried? Does he have, like, health issues? So it's mostly, like, he fears that there'll be estate problems, <laughs> like estate settlement problems. I don't know what he's doing with his money, but he's like, there will be issues. There will be blood. (laughs) And so he's... Poor paranoid man. (laughs) So he decides that he sold... So he decides to sell his interest in 20th century film to uh, famous players. Okay. um, And because he figured he had no alternative. Is it because his wife died? Um, his, he does outlive his wife, and I believe that she does die quite early, so it may be c- because of that. The stress. The source didn't really, like, say anything, but that right. actually makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, he also doesn't trust his son, um, <laughs> to, like, take care of anything, like his business or his legacy, Fair. because, uh, as Nat said, he had no appetite for risk. <laughs> it's like his dumb son, Michael. Yeah. He's just like, Michael's he'll, probably he'll never still make out there. It. Oh, yeah. Probably. probably his dumb alive. son, Michael. Or no, actually, he is dead. Oh. But I don't know why. <laughs> That's oh. what happens. There's I a guess. lot of mysterious <laughs> That's death what happens. In this episode. That's what oh, happens wow. when you don't have an appetite for risk. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> Nat Taylor killed his own son. Confirmed. Oh my not, god. It's not at all. He uh, seems like a cool guy. <laughs> okay, that's good. So instead, Nat kind of like is pursuing a business partner and he winds up um, teaming up with a man by the name of Garth Drabinsky in the 1970s. Drabinsky. Drabinsky. That he's Jewish. Potentially. (laughs) I don't want to start some kind of weird conspiracy chain um, because the world is already doing that. Yeah. And so let's not fuel the fire. So how did they meet? So Drabinsky, so like he's just kind of like a young guy, lots of ambition. He knew that he needed to like spend time with someone who was like in the industry, someone he could learn from because he knew that he had really like reckless drive. Like he's just like, I need to make it big and I will do anything to make it big. He has industry. an appetite for risk. He has way too much of an appetite for risk. Kid's got some moxie about him. Definitely has moxie. <laughs> but that's what Nat said with his mustache. Where did even come from? I don't know. <laughs> so how mean? did they, how did they meet? <laughs> okay. So they meet basically by Drabinsky just cold calling him. He's just like, I know this Nat Taylor guy is, like, really big. I'm just going to call him up. How'd that go? Uh, Taylor just, like, turns him down. Okay. <laughs> He's just like, absolutely not. Who do you think I am? Okay. <laughs> do, do you know who I am? Yeah, so he just, like, turns him down flat. Um, basically, the only connection they had was through, like, Toronto University. Like, they both studied there. And that was his, like, hey... You went to this massive hey. university that U I also T. went to decades <laughs> apart. <laughs> um, but he left an impression. So Nat He had said, moxie. He had a lot of moxie. Nat said, uh, but I was overwhelmed by the kid's confidence and enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Kids got stuff. The kids got moxie. <laughs> <laughs> finger snap. Finger snaps. Finger guns. <laughs> Um, By faithful coincidence, Nat had a seemingly doomed project of his own. His concept for a theater with more than a dozen screens. Oh my god, stop. (laughs) (laughs) He called the cinema complex, or the cineplex. Cineplex. Which is where the word comes from. For years, Nat had been trying in vain to get other exhibitors interested in the idea and was beginning to think that it would die with him. (laughs) Because he's, like, convinced that he's going to die. Also, I love that people are like, no, it's crazy. It'll never work. <laughs> he doesn't have an Oedipus. More cinemas? He just reminds, like, there's just something about his, like, complex with having all of these, like, theaters. It's just like a Greek tragedy. It's Waiting like to happen, Icarus yeah. flying too close to the sun. Like, he believes this is all going <laughs> to blow up, and everybody else believes yeah, it. Yeah, he doesn't have an Oedipus complex. He's got a cinema complex. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. 
<laughs> so uh, my English professor from grade 10, my English teacher, he would be so proud of that. That's we, <laughs> we talked about Greek tragedies in IB 10. <laughs> I'm proud of you. <laughs> so, yeah, he's like he meets Stravinsky at this like crossroad in his career where he's like, yeah. no one will let me build 12 cinemas <laughs> in one building. And so Stravinsky, who like just exudes this like energy and a powerful sense of like self destiny. And that is just like <laughs> rejuvenated and mesmerized by this kid who cold calls him <laughs> after he was like, no kid go away. And he's just like, this is the guy who's going to inherit my legacy. This Stop. dude right here, the man. Now, do you wow. know that name? Dabrinsky? Yeah. Is that a name in no, Canadian cinema? No, I don't know. So I'm <laughs> curious to see where this goes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Could we do a, like a year check-in here? Oh, yeah. What year um, is it? So we are in the 70s now. Uh, so we've like progressed groovy. through his life. His career. It's groovy. <laughs> groovy. <laughs> he's he's grown out his over. hair. <laughs> he, look, he now looks like Christian Bale in American Hustle. Just like, no. that's him now. And a little bit of Lennon. I picture him having some Lennon glasses, you yeah, know? Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> so Nat said Garth was young and impulsive and didn't know a thing about the business, but he's also the brightest, most exciting person to come along in decades. Wow. What <laughs> a, just, now that's, that's a, a resume. That's yeah, a that's a bio. <laughs> That's what Mark should have introduced. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most brilliant thing to come around in decades. <laughs> so Nat started Jerminsky off modestly, putting him in charge of his own publication, a trade journal called Canadian Film Digest. Oh. As they baby were, stepped. Baby stepped. You can't start opening cinemas yet, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I can't trust you with any more yeah, than three cinemas at print. once. Yeah. <laughs> three theaters at most. <laughs> and then we'll work you up to the big leagues. <laughs> As they work together, Drabinsky says, I sucked Taylor's brain dry of every idea he had about the movie business. They both seem equally enamored with one another. Is the wife dead at this point? Yeah. 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 Yvonne's dead. (laughs) There's nothing holding him back. (laughs) In particular, Taylor taught him about the crucial areas of booking movies and how to raise money. And with that as a base, Drabinsky went off on his own in 1975 to practice law and then produce a string of theatrical shows and movies. But the two men began working together again in 1978 when they founded Cineplex. Mm -hmm. Soon after, Nat and Drabinsky launched Pan-Canadian Film Distributors, which is now the country's leading independent film distributor. And in 1979, they cut the ribbon to mark the opening of their first theater complex at Toronto's Eaton Center, Mm, an event that was duly recorded by the Guinness Book of World Records uh, for the largest number of screens, which at the time was 18. Oh my God. That's still pretty big. That is still a big movie theater. I feel like that's huge. (laughs) That's massive to this (laughs) day. There's 18 movies. Yeah. So, like, this is what Nat Taylor is largely remembered for, his invention or innovation of the Cineplex. Right. However, his contribution to Canadian cinema on the production side is also, like, prolific. So, essentially, there's, like, no filmmaking industry in Canada in the 1950s. Like, late 1950s, it had almost been two decades since the National Film Board, with its emphasis on animation, shorts, and documentary, had just taken Mm -hmm. over Canadian film production. And there had not been a sustained attempt at creating an Ontario feature film industry since the mid-1920s. But slowly, things were beginning to change. Disillusioned with working on innocent post-war NFB film strips outlining the importance of nutrition and workplace safety, (laughs) many writers, directors, and producers began to break away and start their own production companies. That just makes me think about, like, Body Break with Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. That's who I want to be for Halloween. Oh, that's a great costume. Oh, that is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so because there was, like, it's true. Like, Canadian cinema, you think of it, and it's... So many, like, of those commercial documentary type things. Yeah. I mean, like, Heritage Minutes, for instance, is something. And Body Break and those uh, Concerned Children's Advertisers ones. Like, the TV that's like, get that cat off my head. And then... (laughs) (laughs) Don't you put it in your mouth. Yeah, don't you put it in your mouth. House Hippo. House Hippo. House Hippo. Yeah. It's my favorite. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. And this is before the tax credit. So... Right. There's just, like, no... 
international interest in filming yeah. in Canada yet. Because that's um, always such a hot topic at home in Lunenburg. Like, the right. tax credit, mm-hmm. when, like, how things are going with that, like, filming and production. Yeah, because yeah. I'm sure it brings a it's lot of business back. to It yeah. brings Lunenburg. a lot of business. Lunenburg has done a lot of movies, a lot of film stuff. <laughs> My movie. Your movie that you are <laughs> have accredited. Yes. What was that? Yes. Oh, uh, the Health Act Explosion movie. The oh. Shattered City movie. I was, like, nine yeah, I was gonna say that was a while ago. I was a girl. I was girl number three. Ooh, um, good number. Yeah, I didn't yeah. die in the explosion. I died in the snowstorm the next day. Yeah. <laughs> that's where I met my that's demise. Where they get you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what nobody's talking about. The storm <laughs> after the storm. Yeah. So although these new companies continued to focus on documentaries and industrial shorts, this shift towards autonomy left many feeling bold enough to consider breaking the stage traditions of NFB filmmaking. So they're like getting creative. Okay. <laughs> Building upon This is where people like you come in, John. Mm. This is this is the Cut story two. about John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this story ends with John. <laughs> So building upon the wealth of experience they had gained at the film board, the directors and writers behind these production companies had just began to consider the possibilities of dramatic filmmaking when they were beaten to the punch. So in October of 1957, a 24-year-old by the name of Sidney J. Fury announced that he had completed his first feature film, oh, which I love Sydney. you. Like, you enter with, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's finished. I made it in my backyard. It needs no 24. This is not here for criticism. It's done. <laughs> yeah, this is <laughs> constructive criticism. No, thank you. Yeah. This is a finished work. The bold face <laughs> confidence of a 24 year old. Oh, my. Um, so it's originally slated as a CBC drama and it's called A Dangerous Age. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and it was nice already guy. in the can before many knew Fury was even trying to make a film. Okay. So it's a coming of age story with uh-huh. a huge few flashes of melodrama. Classic. A Dangerous Age is surprisingly thoughtful and well acted. Uh, David and Nancy, played by Ben Piazza and Anne Pearson, are teenage lovers desperate to tie the knot. One day, David <laughs> sneaks Nancy out of her boarding school to get a marriage license at the local courthouse. They are told they must file a statement of intent and return the next day. Um, So the young lovers find themselves clashing with the rules of adult society and their own marital expectations. Their second trip to the courthouse is cut short when Nancy is arrested for truancy, which I didn't know you could get arrested for. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You're late. (laughs) Cops. Upon her release... Like, late to go back to the boarding school? I th- Yeah, like, so I think the boarding school is, like, she's gone. Arrest her. Arrest her, <laughs> instead of, like, bring her back. Yeah. <laughs> so upon her release, David steals a car and tries to take of his fiancé back to the courthouse. Does he get arrested for stealing the car? <laughs> but the cops are in quick pursuit. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> When the pair is eventually caught, they realize that they aren't ready to face the reality of love and adult world. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a big movie for someone who just did it. And right? They showed up with the he real. needed like a chase scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a lot. Unless it's just models, like you see his hand moving a the dinky car. car. You know what? It probably like, is though. It probably what was this is. like fifty seven? Yeah. This was yeah, like nineteen fifty seven. Or Which just also you can imagine the scandal, right? Like, oh my god, this movie is going to influence our teenage youth, mm. and they're going to try to get married. Oh, <laughs> I'd probably see a remake of that if they like. Yeah. If it wasn't truancy and it was something like dark, dark, yeah. I would see that movie. Drugs, drugs, probably. She got arrested for dealing cocaine to all the prep school girls. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah. She's Nancy's the not the, the yeah. Nancy's not the girl you thought she was. David. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's Ben. Uh, no, his real name is Ben. Ben Piazza is the actor. His name is David. David. Yeah. Nancy and David. Nancy and Nancy David. and Davy. I love it. <laughs> so in his announcement, that of should the be your next project. Nancy yeah, and Davy remake. remake of this. <laughs> oh, this is just the beginning. <laughs> I feel this, like there are some like Canadian. Oh, there. Film people. I feel that like there's some like, lost it, gems. Yes. It needs a remake. <laughs> this deserves all your attention. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, this is like the beginning of Canada, Canada's like B-movie cinema. Mm, excellent. <laughs> so in his announcement of the film's completion, <laughs> that's it. That's the press release. Uh, Fury <laughs> said he didn't know, he didn't see why marketable features couldn't be made regularly in Canada, optimistically predicting that he would go on to make one picture a year. <laughs> 
like yeah, the original Woody Allen. <laughs> he's like, that was easy. Yeah. Let's like, do it again. I don't know what all the fuss is about. <laughs> Although A Dangerous Age suffers slightly from Fury's inexperience as a director, he had high hopes for it connecting with an audience. Film de France agreed to distribute the film in the United Kingdom, where it it was reviewed as distinctly encouraging by the (laughs) British Film Institute's monthly film bulletin. That's so British. It's so British. It's like, distinctly encouraging. (laughs) It's not good, (laughs) but it's encouraging. Don't get carried away. (laughs) Such a pat on the head for yeah. Canada. Yeah, pat, yeah. pat. <laughs> nice try. Um, but on this side of the Atlantic, it was another story. Fury did not anticipate the difficulties he would face in securing North American distribution, which eluded him at every turn. So he just can't mm. find cinemas to run the film. The sudden appearance of a dangerous age made may have surprised Canada's new independent filmmakers, but Nat, who's at this point the head of 20th Century Fox uh, theater chain, which was the third largest in Ontario at the time, had been just, like, waiting for this kind of development. Mm-hmm. So he's like, yep. finally, someone's making movies in Canada. As a even pop- if it's trash. <laughs> even if it's <laughs> garbage. Yeah. Someone's making a movie that's not an NFB film, like, yeah. documentary on ducks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hinterland, who's who, you know? Yeah. I always thought that was Hunter's Land, and then I realized how, like... Dark that how, is? Yeah, because it's about <laughs> saving the animals. The Canadian lynx. There's three left. <laughs> Two left. <laughs> okay. So, Nat's excited. So, <laughs> he's Nat rearing is, to go. Nat is over the moon. Okay. So, as the publisher of Canadian Film Weekly, uh, Nat was using his regular column to call for government support for Canadian features. Nat saw himself as an industry insider who could give a larger cultural meaning to the low-budget pictures that independent film companies across Toronto were now considering. Mm-hmm. Nat knew that if a Canadian feature could be sold to a major studio, it would not only be a boon to the industry, it would also strengthen his case for federal funding. So he's True. like looking for the film, like he the spark. It. Yeah. He's looking for the money, the money maker. To make a low budget film that would take advantage of this opportunity, Nat looked to Julian Rothman, a seasoned NFB director. Rothman had co founded Meridian Films, which housed the soundstage Fury used on A Dangerous Age. In ni- October of 1958, so uh, Nat's wife, Yvonne, formed Taylor and Rothman Productions and immediately signed on as a co-producer for the film The Bloody Brood. So wait, did this go back in time? Yes. So we are now back in time. So it's like his cinema career, but he's mm-hmm. also very important outside of like okay, okay, cinema okay. complexes <laughs> <Okay>. just <laughs> cinema. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're back in the 50s. It's okay. like 10 years 20 years previous. Okay. Um, So they're going to co-produce a film called The Bloody Brood, which is a beatnik crime film. Amazing. (laughs) Beatnik. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it stars a young Peter Falk as Nico, a (laughs) smooth-talking mentor to the gang of coffeehouse beatniks. Okay. In his pursuit of, quote, kicks, Nico (laughs) proclaims that, quote, murder is the last great challenge to the creative mind. (laughs) Wow. This is like, okay, in my head, I'm envisioning um, West Side Story and The Outsiders mixed with like... Bongos. Yeah. (laughs) All the bongos. All the snaps. I'm so happy you said that (laughs) because when an unsuspecting messenger boy drops by his wild bongo party... Oh, no. Wild bongo party. (laughs) You knew. (laughs) The uh, next night, Nico offers him, guess guess what his murder <laughs> weapon of choice is. How do you think he's going to kill this boy? Tell me. Uh, Arsenic. No. no. Is it like a beatnik-y thing? <laughs> what is a beatnik? It is, gonna, it is so off It was like pre brand. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, hammer. <laughs> <laughs> he offers him a hamburger? <laughs> Laced with shards of glass. Oh. <laughs> what? Wouldn't you notice as soon the as you bit it? The glass burger tray. <laughs> Wouldn't you be like, like, how do you finish the burger? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to be rude. <laughs> <laughs> but then your like, face is bleeding. What? Your gums. <laughs> what? Oh, God. 
So the boy these dies. Hippies, <laughs> these beatniks were high when they came up with this. It's on the Arby's <laughs> menu, isn't it? It's kind of close. <laughs> Okay, don't spread false information. There are no burger gotta. joints closing right gotta. now. <laughs> so the boy dies via burger <laughs> laced with glass, and the body is disposed of. Frustrated by the slow and inconclusive police investigation, the victim's brother, Cliff, traces the delivery route in search of clues. Convinced that Nico is behind the monstrous crime, Cliff <laughs> infiltrates the circle of beatniks and starts hanging out at the coffee house. Okay, so dangerous. Okay, <laughs> just like it's like Kerouac. It's just yeah. like yeah. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> no one cares. Uh, After a run-in with a pair of strong-armed thugs, Cliff unmasks Nico not only as the killer, but as an underworld gangster masquerading as an authentic hipster. So mm. Nico, this whole time, is like this underworld gangster who's trying to turn beatniks <laughs> into thugs. <laughs> I Shady. guess. Because that's, you know, your demographic, I guess. What? <laughs> so with an emphasis on thrills, the bloody Does brood... he kill him? Like, does he get revenge for his brother's death? Or just, like... He unmasks it. I think he, like, gets him arrested. Okay. But, like, I didn't watch the movie. Um, right. That sounds should, like a though. bad Scooby-Doo. <laughs> with no dog. Pulls off the yeah. mask. It's like, it was Nico! <laughs> So with an emphasis on thrills, The Bloody Brood is undoubtedly more of an exploitation film than A Dangerous Age. Mm -hmm. Still, the tightly paced story and competent direction gives the film a level of professionalism comparable to American B-movies of the time. Right. But despite Rothsman... Ex uh, mm. Mm -mm. Uh. Mm. But despite Rothsman's experience, The Bloody Brood is still rough around the edges and falls victim to budgetary constraints. Harsh lighting in many of the scenes shot at Meridian Soundstage gives, gives the film a flat look that lacks the menacing atmosphere needed to properly complement Falk's ominous performance. Both films did not fare well, yeah. with their <laughs> anti-society, gory themes not finding distributors easily. This wasn't exactly the fate Nate envisioned for the films that he once regarded as stepping stones to the Canadian film industry. Right. Nat turned his attention to another company for his next attempt. Earlier that year, he had presented at the premiere of a feature made by the producer-director team of Norman Clemen and William Davidson. Now That April's Here, which came out in 1958. Despite its obvious Canadian content, which combined three Morley Callahan-penned dramatic shorts, mm. the film had only received mixed reviews. But Nat recognized Clemens and Davidson's talent and in the fall of 1959 convinced them to try a movie in the same vein as Fury and Rothsman's films by committing uh, half of the financing. So he really wants it to be a horror film, which okay. I'm also not sure. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be getting much traction. Yeah, I don't know if it's just like kind of today where it's like mm. it's a seasonal film, you know it's going to get money, like you right. know it's going to draw people in. But it also seems like the hardest to get federal funding for. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not sure exactly why it has to be a horror film. But the result was called The Ivy League Killers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wonder what that one's about. So, yeah. it centers on a tense conflict between spoiled rich college kid Andy and a leather jacket motorcycle gang known as the Black Diamonds. <laughs> okay. The film was plagued by problems from the beginning. Yeah. Shocker. <laughs> Nat's funding fell through, and Clement and Davidson were forced to shop an unfinished version to American distributors for the completion of the funds. Allied artist competitor American International Pictures was interested, but refused to advance them any money. Eventually, the picture was finished with the help of private investors at a budget of half of what Fury's film had cost. Okay. But by this time, the only buyer was American television, and it was five more years before the Ivy League killers finally lit up a Canadian theater screen under a new title, The Fast Ones. <laughs> okay. The film's failure to That's garner... That's a cool title. That is a cool title. Ones. It's like... The prequel to the Fast and the Furious. The, pre -pre the fast. Pre -pre They're just fast. They're yeah. not furious. Yet. Yeah, they are just <laughs> only fast. They just, just like constantly going fast. But there's no like conflict. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing to get angry about. It's just Ricky Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants to go fast. Sonic, go go fast. Uh. The film's failure to garner studio attention meant that a breakthrough picture was yet to be made. 
After the Bloody Brood, Taylor Rothman Productions announced several different projects, ranging from a series of films based on the works of Canadian literary figures to Cry of the Unborn, a potentially, potentially oh, lurid no. expose of the baby adoption racket. Okay. So it's like an expose series. Yeah. <laughs> what a racket. <laughs> what a racket. <laughs> People are just like hungry for babies. And oh, so God. there's just a, an, a baby adoption racket. That's what was it? The Unborn Cry? Uh, the Cry of the Unborn. Oh. It's a good title. Yeah, but it's, it's gripping. Yeah. <laughs> it's gripping. I want to watch it. Yeah, <laughs> but do I? However, it was the Bloody Brood's unexpected difficulties with the censors that really determined its next project. With Vaughn Taylor once again acting as co-producer, Rothman started work on The Mask, a tamer commercial film that would offer audiences thrills without violence, shock without brutality. The Jim okay. Carrey one. <laughs> Not imagine? the Jim Carrey one. Sadly, no. Sadly, no. <laughs> but I do think that it's a remake of this. Really? Kind of seems like it. Yeah. Like he was a very, like, like, even the mask, like, what he, like, his costume is very, like, roaring. Yeah, like, yeah. the, like, the yellow suit. Yeah. And the yeah. checkered tie and, like, the big flower in his, or a uh, big feather in the... Those hats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't like, I know I've seen the mask like forever ago that like the Jim Carrey version. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's like a cursed mask that he wears and he can do any, like he, like, turns he becomes into, like, the a, guy, right? Like a cartoon almost version of himself. Right. It's like all his fears go out the window and he's like confident. Right. And yeah. So this is like kind of like that, except it leans more horror, I guess. Hmm. So it's shot partially in 3D. Oh. Um, so that's fancy. Yeah. Like the red and blue glasses. Wow. Yeah. Um, so the mask is a thinly veiled drug parable about <laughs> Dr. Barnes, a psychiatrist who finds himself in an eerie Freudian dream world where he puts on an ancient Indian ritual mask. Mm -hmm. As he continues to experiment You're with like, the mask. I'm with you. He's like, I'm uh -huh. there. <laughs> yep. Keep, proceed. <laughs> As he continues to experiment with the mask to explore his own subconscious desires, the doctor's grip on sanity is tested until he finds himself inexplicably attacking his receptionist. <laughs> this is, yeah, I think this is definitely the Jim Carrey is a remake of remake this. Remake of this, yeah. yeah. Attacking his receptionist. Because he, like, he, like, doesn't remember crimes he commits. Yeah, and it's, it's like, I mean, this one, like they say, it's, like, thinly veiled to talk about, like, this is why you don't do drugs, kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that, like, you do stuff and you don't remember doing it, but you're still responsible for them. Like, na 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 Boring, boring, boring. Drugs are bad. Uh. <laughs> a marked improvement on The Bloody Brood. Uh, okay. The Mask easily succeeds with a unique mix of adult films and a fairground spook house effects. So it's just kind of, like... Because of the... The 3D glasses? Yeah, it's very gimmicky. So it's like, mm -hmm. because you put the glasses on, it's like fairground spook house. Like, they'll just throw things at you yeah. kind of thing, right? <laughs> it's like the opposite of watching Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. You're it's not just, throwing yeah. things. They're throwing things at you. Yeah. Yeah. You just get hit with a tomato. <laughs> like, what? Some dude pops out from behind. He's like, this is my cue. <laughs> just like whiffing <laughs> stuff at the audience. Uh, uh. In an interactive twist, movie patrons were given cardboard cutout magic mystic <laughs> masks with built-in 3D glasses. No. Whoa. So cool. it's, yeah, so they're like designed for this movie. Experience. This is intense. Yeah. This is like a this is like a Disney World this experience is a, right a here. Multi-level marketing scheme. What, <laughs> what year are we in right now? So this would be uh, early 60s, like 61. Trippy. 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 <laughs> So they're given these glasses and they're told to put them on whenever they hear Barnes told to put his mask on. Mm -hmm. So when Barnes is putting the mask on, you also put on the mask. You know what's crazy about how like cyclical like fashion and art is? is yeah. That there was a movie that came out of Japan last year and they thought it was a revolutionary <laughs> because there was one scene that was 3D and it's of the main character going into a movie theater putting on 3D glasses and that's when the audience was supposed to put on their 3D glasses. Oh. And <laughs> critics in like Japan and like North America were like, How whoa. Netta. Yeah. You revolutionized film going. Yeah. 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 And so it's like crazy to hear 
about this. Yeah, and, mm. and I remember going to see Spy Kids oh, 3D. Oh, and, and Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Shark Boy mm. and Lava yeah. Girl. And, like, those were movies where they very specifically tell you to put them on at a certain point in the yeah. film. Like, not yeah. the whole movie is no, shot in 3D. No, it was, like, put on your glasses. Yeah, it was just, like, I, I have... We could only afford nine minutes <laughs> yeah, of 3D. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember Shark Boy and Lava Girl, like, because when you bought the DVD, it came with 3D glasses, and you could do it at home. And I remember doing it at home being like, this sucks. Yeah. It's like, everything's blue and red, and it's not as big as the movie theater screen. Yeah, and yeah. then Grace cried. And then I cried. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when they came out with, um, like, the polarized ones, like the black 3D yeah. glasses, oh, yeah. I remember thinking, like, we are in the future. Every movie is going to be 3D mm-hmm. from well, now on. Yeah, and I remember being, like, a kid and coming into Halifax as, like, a special trip over March break with my mom and going to the um, theater in Bears Lake and seeing an IMAX movie, and they were all documentaries. They weren't, yeah. like, real mm-hmm. movies. And you put on the 3D glasses, and it was just, like... Whoa. So cool. <laughs> you know what's crazy? To this day, I think the best 3D movie I've ever seen is Jackass 3D. Because it was just like... It, like, it was like well, it was one shot of those in like, 3D, right? Right, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was like um, definitely the same with like that spook house kind of thing. It's like it gave them an excuse. Like they were doing whatever they wanted anyway. Yeah, yeah. So then all these like paint explosions were like coming at your face and like it just oh, gave them such They played up the gimmick a lot. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And it was just like, I was like, that's, it's the only time that I've like enjoyed a 3D movie. I was like, this More makes than sense. The 2D, yeah. As opposed to like, I don't care if a plane looks like it's flying at my face for two seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember seeing Avatar in 3D. Like, oh, yeah. and I was like, it is amazing. Oh, yeah. So each of the like 3D trip scenes in the movie or sequences were written and designed by a veteran editor and montage designer called Slavico Vorkapik. <laughs> okay. Mm. <laughs> that's a name. Um, and like, yeah, he's, he, that's his thing. So he's not like shy about like hurling fireballs and snakes and sacrificial knives at the audience. (laughs) Okay. You know, so even though the 3d trend had kind of died out in Hollywood about five or six years earlier, the mask was picked up by Warner brothers and became the first Canadian feature film to be distributed across North America by a major studio. It opened to a generally positive uh, review and the average box office just in time for Halloween of 1961. Uh, we did smart. it. We smart did marketing. It. Today, The Mask has achieved a minor cult following and is considered one of the greatest gimmick films of all time. I'm definitely going to watch that. Yeah. That we should watch percent. it. We should watch it. We should watch it for Halloween. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good idea. Mm. Yeah. We should get some 3D glasses. And <laughs> <laughs> you need the vintage. We'll like, make, we can make our own mask. weird tiki masks and, yeah. and watch it together. Screw carving pumpkins. Yeah. This is the new Canadian Halloween yeah. tradition. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear any more about Hocus Pocus or like anything else. Yeah. It's the mask and you have to make your own mask, mask. to watch the movie. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So insanity-inducing masks and lethal burgers may not have been much of an initial impression with Canadian audiences or critics, but they didn't go completely unnoticed. A few years after the mask hit New York City theaters, an NFB-produced English feature made a big impression at the city's 1964 film festival. Initially written off as a failure by Canadian critics, Nobody Waved Goodbye was later reclaimed and hailed as not only the birth of English-Canadian cinema, but also a predecessor to the, quote, loser cinema of going down the road and paperback hero. (laughs) These all sound like such made-up titles. Uh, Paperback (laughs) hero. Going down the road. Uh, (laughs) To where? Who knows? No one waved goodbye, sad. I know. (laughs) While there is no doubt that sensationalistic thrills of films like The Ivy League Killers and The Mask challenge contemporary views of Canadian cinema, even in the late 1950s, they had to contend with accusations of selling out since there was, since it was believed they only sought to emulate Hollywood films. So, like, there's already hipsters in Canadian cinema who are like, you're selling out by making a horror film. Oh, gosh. Nevertheless, it's the early successes and failures of Sidney J. Fury, Julian Rothman, and William Davidson that proved feature filmmaking was a viable cultural industry. Mm -hmm. They were the first of a new generation of filmmakers who helped English Canada reclaim its future by trading the Snowy Pass and the Mounties Redcoats for a basement coffee house and a beat-up leather jacket. Mm. Because, like, before that... Super stereotypical. Super yeah. stereotypical, like Canadiana films. Mm-hmm. That they're yeah. like, that's the only thing that will sell in an American market because that's what they think Canada is. Uh, 
which is selling out more yeah. than like yeah, making a worse. film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to kind of like round out Nat's biography a little bit, mm-hmm. um, after the passing of his first wife, yeah. he remarried an actress. Her oh. name is Claire Draney Woldinger. Woldinger? Woldinger. Uh, okay. She changes her name to Taylor. Oh, okay. <laughs> surprisingly. That's Thank um, God. In 1968. <laughs> Um, she was about 10 years younger than that. And okay. in her autobiography, she always refers to him as Grandpa Nate. Oh, God. Which is Nate. so awful. Or Nat, sorry. Sorry. Grandpa <laughs> no, Nat. No, you're right. Thank you. It's yeah. worse than Daddy. That's it's, like an other level. <laughs> that's Ugh. super cringy. That's so cringy. <laughs> and also, it was only 10 years. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Is like, that's not even that bad for this podcast. We've had like way yeah. bigger but age But that's gaps. not even bad for like the Today, world. I yeah. think 10 years. I think that's fine. It's not. Um, my yeah. parents are eleven years apart, so I'm yeah. like. Yeah. When when you're of a certain age, I think it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. But yeah, grandpa when you're both Nate. like consenting adults, it's cool. Nat, <laughs> <laughs> grandpa Nat. Nat, you keep calling him me. I, keep calling, I don't know why. Which, Only in the context of grandpa. You know what's weird is that like it would have been weirder if she called him grandpa Nate. <laughs> <laughs> as a little boy, like, she's like, I don't even know his name. <laughs> <laughs> He just married. Well, actually, that makes sense because he proposed to her after six weeks. Oh, God. So, like, maybe she didn't know his name. Oh, <laughs> man. No, it's just me mispronouncing it. Oh, man. And, but he's still not dead at this point. Oh, no. Like, the guy who thought he was going to die is no. still alive. Nope. <laughs> okay. This was, like, around the time that he starts thinking, like, I might die. Okay. <laughs> so. It's interesting that he was still worried about what to do with his fortune even though he remarried. Maybe she's the problem. Yeah. yeah. So she has a bunch of ex-husbands. So maybe he's just like, oh. I love this woman, but she will kill me in my sleep <laughs> yeah. and take everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, does she have ex-husbands or dead husbands? Ex-husbands. <laughs> okay. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There could be some, like, burgers laced with glass in yeah. some <laughs> corner of the room. <laughs> so his proposal to Claire uh, basically went like this. He just casually remarked, well, we'll probably have lots of problems with the kids after we're married. And Claire Did was she like, have kids? <laughs> yeah. she had kids from previous okay. marriages, and he has his son from his marriage with Yvonne. Right. Um, his useless son who his useless doesn't son have a Michael. passion for risk <laughs> <laughs> dies. What a loser. What a loser. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Claire was like, since when are we going to get married? And he said, oh, don't be stupid. You're going to marry me. Wow. Oh. Like, what a jerk. <laughs> Which I guess you could say that in a tone that is like sweet, but also like, don't call me stupid. Yeah. I'm not yeah, stupid. Yeah, that's a mean one. <laughs> yeah. I'm not stupid. That Nat, he was a mean one. Grandpa uh. Nat. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa Nate. Uh. <laughs> yeah, the brain is shutting down at the very end. Uh. So in 1984, uh, Nat was given a Genie Award for oh. outstanding contribution to the business of filmmaking. Um, He also received an honorary degree from York University. Um, That was after he donated a movie theater uh, (laughs) and had it. He just has them in his garage now. (laughs) (laughs) Pop-up movie theaters. Yeah, and then he made them name it after him. Oh. (laughs) Also give me an honorary (laughs) degree. Also. (laughs) I love that his, like, cinema's come in an Ikea box. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, next. (laughs) They'll be in boxes. (laughs) Box office? What about all of it's a box? (laughs) Hi, I'm Nat. (laughs) I'd like to show you my idea. Thank you, dragons, for (laughs) considering my idea. See my cinema in a box. Cinema in a box. Uh. Um, But yeah, so the man who was constantly fearing his death did eventually pass away uh, on March 1st, 2004, at the age of 98. I was a real human. I remember 2004. Yeah. I was was like full on in high school in 2004. Yeah. Yeah. Like this guy was around for, like, it's just the way that the Heritage Minute is set up. It just makes it seem like it was, because it was a long time ago, but it's like his contributions were like so in the past. But he's a very like But this Heritage Minute was definitely made before he died. That's Definitely. true. I was, yeah. That's and an we don't like, see many thing, like, like that. Yeah, yeah no, because we've talked about it a lot where, like, from a public funding standpoint for history, it's a lot easier to make commemorations about people who are dead because mm-hmm. then they can't go off and do weird yeah. things. Mm. They can't, they can't <laughs> mess up and yeah. do something terrible that you don't want to have that minute about them, which has kind of happened with uh, the Louis Riel minute. 
yeah, a little bit. So the Louis Real Minute, well. but it, so it's been taken off. Um, mm. Their the circulation. You can yeah. see it on YouTube, but it's taken off the Historic Canada site. Which I don't know if it's because of something he did. I or don't more think so. so. The way they I did think the it's minute. the way they did the minute. Which is literally them just hanging him. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, so, we did it. I think. And it's the RCMP, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, well, f- it was, yeah, it it's, was. Yeah, a lot police. of layers. It was but, like in front of their mess hall, I heard. Like, literally. The RC- When he, he was hung. He was hanged in the... <laughs> he was hung. We yeah. learned the difference yeah, between difference hung between and hanged things. in that, uh, in that um, episode. He was hanged We don't know if he was hung. the barracks. So <laughs> yeah. at like an R... Well, they weren't... I don't know if they were the Royal Canadian Mounted Police yet. They would have been they Northwest weren't. Mounted they Police. They were Northwest Mounted Police. Um, but same deal. Yeah. It's mm. pretty bad. Yeah, not great. So... I think there's a reason they took it down. But, uh, but yeah, that's interesting though because I don't know if there is another one that... They're still... Was made about the person who's still alive. Yeah, because even Kenuik Ashevex was done after she passed away. After she passed away. There are people, like, connected to them that are alive. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Plond like, yeah. Jacques still been alive. Which one? Jacques Plant? No. Really? Jacques Plant died, died like when 70s. he was, like, yeah. Oh, wow. He was, yeah. like, 50 when he died. He was young. Really young. He had, like... Um, um, it was a heart attack. Cancer. 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 Yeah. Jackie Robinson, heart attack. Um, Jacques Plant, cancer. Cancer. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Legends. <laughs> Legends. <laughs> Legends never die. Oh, wait. Yeah, right. They do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but briefly, speaking of heritage myths, did you know there's a new one coming out? Yes. Super exciting. That's but cool. it looks very similar to Marion Orr. I'm a little confused. I did look her up. Is she a flight up. attendant? She, so she she is an engineer. So she designs <gasps> cool. planes and she That's helps cool. design the Spitfire. Was she a flight attendant? <laughs> <laughs> Canada's first flight attendant. <laughs> Air stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's wrap this up. We'll wrap this up. We can, we can talk. <laughs> so of Nat, uh, Drabinsky said, he was a father to me, a teacher Aww. to me, a friend, and a business partner. He was everything. He used to smoke stogies in his Art Deco office. <sighs> when you went to see him, you knew you were in the presence of someone special. He had an air of great success about him. He was a remarkable human being. Wow. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And that's the story of Nat Taylor. That's such a cool visual. Of Canadian B movie cinema. Just like yeah. in your Art Deco office, that's smoking cool. the stogies. Yeah, <laughs> I bet he had it. like that's a cool. glass bottle set with some brown liquor in it. <laughs> I just imagine him like looking out over the Toronto skyline, smoking a cigar, and he's like, "We need more beatnik movies." <laughs> <laughs> when am I gonna die? <laughs> I wonder if that burger was laced with anything. <laughs> I hate my son. <laughs> God, Michael's such a disappointment. But I love Yvonne. I'll make another movie theater, this time in an aquarium. Yeah. <laughs> More. That one would actually be impressive. Yeah. It would just be like, we're going to build a movie theater with a patio. And everyone's like. <laughs> okay, Nat. <laughs> Call Guinness. Call the world record books. <laughs> We've done it again. And he's like, okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, John, so much thank for you being guys. here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Our first, like, it. real guest. Our first, like, real guest. And, uh, you know, Mark got something right this time. Oh. So that's cool. <laughs> Shout out to Mark. <laughs> Shout out to producer Mark for having a cool friend. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, really, our opinion of Mark is just slowly deteriorating. It's <laughs> <just> over time. <laughs> We love you very much, Mark. We love you so much, producer Mark. Thank you yeah. for being a great producer and a great friend. Yeah. And doing for our little story segment in the last episode. That yes. was great. For anyone who listened to <laughs> the part two of the Louis Riel episode, uh, our producer Mark uh, is just so hilarious. I laughed too hard over his little <laughs> intro. Um, so thank you, Mark, for that. All right. Thanks so much for listening to the episode, guys. And uh, for all of you who aren't already following us on social media, you don't know what you're doing. We're hilarious. Uh, on Facebook and Instagram, we are at Minute Women Podcast. You should check it out because I just posted a who's who, Louis Riel, uh, or Edgar Allan Poe kind of little game. It's pretty fun. The resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> uncanny. Uh, we're also on Twitter at The Minute Women. And then we have a really great website put up by our amazing producer, Mark, which is <laughs> www.minutewomenpodcast.ca. Uh, it's got links to all of the sources Grace, is, Grace uses for each episode, and it's also got links to all of the episodes and info about us. So, uh, yeah, check it out. 
and make sure you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If your platform allows you to leave a review, specifically Apple Podcasts, please leave us a little star rating. We need you. Write up a little review. It's a big, big support to us. And make sure you tell all of your friends because yeah. the word of mouth is the best review possible. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.